Hello. Am I on? Oh, okay. Sounds good. Whoa, sounds really good. Ow. All right. Ready? All right, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. I have to say, I'm, I'm still not getting used to the fact of walking up front. Usually there's a big chatter fest going on, and I have to tell people to take their seats and stop getting coffee and all that. I'm not going to get used to it, but I'm just I'm delighted to see each and every one of you here. 
as we are gathered to worship in spirit and truth. A couple of you I hadn't seen yet, so glad to glad that you all are here. Um, I want to thank the church for praying for me as I recovered from gallbladder surgery. It's still still a healing process, but you can see I'm here. I'm going to uh, not sing today just so I don't blow any stitches or anything, but I'm really sorry about that because these are wonderful gospel-centered songs. So I, I know this may be getting somewhat routine for those of you at home that are watching this. I know it's hard to, to worship at home um, when you're not with the whole body, but I really pray that the Holy Spirit will move your hearts as we sing these wonderful songs. Stand up, whatever it does to get your attention and to focus your mind on God's love for you in Jesus Christ. So we welcome everyone here in the building, those at home, uh, those across the oceans, wherever you are, we're one body in Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the gospel. And we're here to celebrate that this morning. We're also delighted to hear the gospel this morning from uh, the campus minister of our presbytery, uh, Heath McLaughlin. I always struggle with his last name, but it's, Mc, it's Heath a wonderful brother, if you haven't heard him preach before, he will point you to Jesus this morning, and mostly because the text is all about Jesus, uh, and it's a, one of my favorite texts, so again, prepare your hearts uh, for that. Uh, there's a lot of announcements. I'll try to get them through them quickly. They're in the bulletin if you're here. They're also at home if you got the email attachment, so I'll just go over them briefly, but uh, again, we're following the health protocols. Those should be self-explanatory by now. We just ask people to respect those, not just for our sakes, but for our community um, as well. You'll see that we also have a Sunday evening worship service. We incur that's just one more way to keep gathering in person uh, where we can do it safely uh, with limited numbers. So sign up for that and come back for that. That'll be led by uh, Pastor Rolo tonight. Home fellowship groups have um, started, and so we there's again there's an insert. There's at least twelve or thirteen of them. Uh, one in particular is geared just to undergraduates, the Sanders, who will do a wonderful job. Uh, that's by Zoom on Wednesday nights, but they're all of them look wonderful. Some of them are in backyards, some of them are by Zoom, but we're split. We have so many this year so that they can be smaller in number, so that we don't have a huge Hollywood Square situation going on with the Zoom meeting. So please look at those, figure out which one to provide fellowship. We can't provide as much fellowship as we want Sunday morning. So home groups are the main way we are doing that uh, this semester. Uh, we also wanna give a warm welcome to college students. And again, it's just not the same. We can't give you college breakfast. Our famous potlucks are on hiatus, but we love you guys. And so we're giving you a different kind of potluck, but one in which you don't have to bring any food. Actually, you never did before. But, uh, but the, we're going to have backyard gatherings, and they're going to continue. And so you can go. How do you sign up for these backyard gatherings where you can come with a small group of friends safely, uh, be welcomed by members of the church, be fed free food? How do you sign up for those? Well, go to our church website. And that's my little plug. We just rebooted a new church website very clear links, very easy to navigate, lots of fun pictures. So I want to thank uh, Drew Bowman and David Poteet for just pouring themselves into that and getting that ready to go. But it's very simple, college students, for you to sign up for those backyard gatherings uh, on, that, on our website. Just click through. Uh, our middle school and high school groups are beginning to meet again um, uh, Sunday night, so pay attention to that as well. Our women are beginning to meet again in various ways, safe walks together, uh, a Zoom Bible study Thursday mornings as well, a prayer meeting Saturday mornings, either in person or by Zoom. So again, we're doing what we can to keep up the fellowship that we have in Christ. Um, finally, I want to just plug one special ministry that you may have overlooked, and that is our, our YouTube adult classes. We're not having Sunday school, but Pastor Rollo has been putting together amazing 20-minute lectures on YouTube that all you have to do is, is whenever you want to during the week with a family, sit down with them or your roommates or by yourself, sit down and watch this 20-minute lecture. They are amazing. His one on polycarp last week, if you don't even know who polycarp is, there you go. It's not a disease. It's a, uh, he was one of the original saints of the church. Go back and look at that video. There'll be another one posted tonight, I believe, as well. So I really want us to take advantage uh, of those wonderful times of instruction. That's a lot of announcements, and I'm sorry for that, but that's this time of year. But you didn't come here to hear me talk. You came here to worship. 
And we're going to do that. We're going to prepare our hearts for just a moment uh, to worship. Uh, and then we are going to call each other to worship with Psalm 131, which tells us to do what? Well, it's what we're going to sing. Jesus cast a look on me. Still our hearts before God. Stop trusting ourselves. Remember that he loves us through Jesus Christ and that we can be like little children before him. So let's prepare to do just that. Sisters and brothers, please stand together. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters of things too wonderful for me. But I have, but I have stilled, stilled and quieted my soul, my soul like, like a weaned child with its, its mother. mother. Like, like a weaned child is my, is my soul within, within me. me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Let's sing together the song that calls Jesus to just see us, to be seen and known by him. Um, what grace. <laughs> My busy pride Cast it evermore aside Bid my will to thine submit Lay me humbly at thy feet Make me like a little my strength and wisdom's voice, seeing only in thy light, walking only in thy mind, leaning on thy loving breast, where a weary soul can rest. of God flowing from his precious blood in this posture let me live and Hosanna's daily give in this temper let me Cast a look on me. Our Lord Christ, we do thank you that you turn no one away who comes to you. We ask you to cast a look on us knowing that you will and that you have us firmly in your hands and that we love you only because you first loved us. So our hope and surety is in that, so encourage us now in this difficult time. Whatever trials we are going through, help us to cast ourselves on you, to trust you, to set aside our pride, and let you work within us. And help us now first to worship you together with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Uh, and so now I'm going to ask you to please be seated before we have our confession of faith. Because I want us to have our confession of faith together as the body of Christ, whether at home 
or here in the building. And we have, uh, believe it or not, God is still growing his church uh, through this time. And we have to do it in different ways with Zoom interviews and things like that. But there are a number of new members who have joined our church. And I, if we were more sophisticated, we have, we'd have a little video introduction or pictures. We're just not that cool. So I'm gonna, their names are in the bulletin, and I'm going to read them to you. And uh, then we're going to pray for them. And I really want you to pray for these new brothers and sisters. And as you have a chance, try to meet them. So uh, Grace Height has joined. She's, I believe, is a senior. She's from Durham, North Carolina. Uh, and she's involved in RUF, just a wonderful sister in Christ. So I encourage you to, to, to welcome her. Uh, Jason Mosier has joined. Also, I, I believe, a senior, from, uh, but he's from Northern Virginia. Uh, he's involved in the CCF um, uh, ministry on campus. Just, again, a, a wonderful brother in Christ. Chris and Olivia O'Hara have joined us. Now, they're in, actually, they're all interesting, but uh, Chris was with us as an undergraduate. Then he moved to Roanoke, and there he met uh, his now wife, Olivia. And then Olivia is with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and is the staff member at InterVarsity here at Tech. So they moved back here. Uh, and so they have actually are leading a home group as well, so uh, pray for the O'Hara's. And then finally, Chris and Lynn Strange, uh, uh, again, just a wonderful couple. They are Brent Strange's parents, if you couldn't figure that out. Uh, they have lived all over the place, in fact, in, in part as missionaries uh, to the Philippines. But now the Lord has brought them to Craig County, so near their family, and they have also, the Lord has led them to join our church. So. Let's pray for these new brothers and sisters in, in, in Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for, uh, for Grace, for Jason, for Chris, uh, for Olivia, for Chris again, and for Lynn. Thank you for each of their stories of grace that you have caused them uh, to trust Jesus alone and that we are united to them. And even though we cannot see them, Lord, we love them. <laughs> even as we can't see you, Jesus, but we love you. And so watch over them, help them to grow, uh, bless our church through them, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so now I'm going to ask for everyone to stand up again, whether you're at home or in the room. We want to confess our faith together with uh, these new members uh, to know what is our hope. And so I will begin and, and we will all repeat these words from the Apostle Paul, uh, reminding ourselves that even though Paul is talking about himself here, in truth, if we're honest with ourselves, they apply to us as well. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners... Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example of those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And so now share the peace of Jesus with one another. Just take a couple of minutes, write a text to somebody. Uh, if you're at home or if you're in the room, wave, give a fist bump, whatever you're comfortable with, and welcome each other.
All right, please, uh, if you're at home, settle down, sit on your sofa, get back in bed, whatever you're doing. Grab a See, at home, at least, you can have snacks. I'm going to ask for a show of hands of those at home. How many of you are eating snacks or breakfast? Those of us here in the room, we don't get to do that. So there is an advantage to staying home in that sense. But let's continue our worship right now. And we're going to do so um, by reading a whole chapter from Isaiah 35. And I want, as I read this chapter to you, I want you to let it prepare your hearts for hearing about our Lord Jesus later and the way he treats people that are in need. So hear now God's word to you this morning from the Old Testament. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. Think about the situation we're now in. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Oh, that speaks to me. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert." The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, when they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is the word of the Lord. What an amazing passage that tells us that God will meet all our needs. If we are deaf, he will give us hearing in his time. If we are lame, he will one day help us to leap. But moreover, he provides a way of righteousness that only the clean can walk on. How can we be clean? It's by the blood of Jesus Christ. And once you're on that way, he promises to protect us he promises to give us joy that we will be ransomed, we will be redeemed. So let's come now because it also says even if you're a fool, you won't go astray. And we have to confess sometimes we are foolish. We stray back into sin. So let's come now uh, and be sure that we are on the way of Christ by confessing our sins together with these words uh, found in uh, the book of Isaiah as we all pray together, saying, Father in heaven, we confess that we have not sought you as we should, nor called upon you enough when you were near. We have not forsaken all our evil ways, and many of our thoughts remain unrighteous. O oh Lord, help us return to you. Remind us of your unfailing compassion, and that you are a God who abundantly pardons. Accomplish your great purpose of redemption in us by the word of your gospel, that in the name of Jesus Christ and his work, we may go out with joy and be led forth in peace. Amen. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. 
Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Amen. Stand with us for the doxology, please. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Still my favorite part of the service. Let's please stand, uh, excuse me, please sit. <laughs> and now we want to pray for the children. In just a moment, we're going to sing the hymn for all the saints. And we want to remind the children that are here and that are home that you are saints. You are part of Christ's kingdom as you trust the good news of Jesus Christ. You are a valued part of the body of Christ, equal with all of us. So we love you and let us pray for you at this moment. So let's bow together. Our God and Father, we're sorry that we can't bring kids up anymore and goof around with them um, and give them candy. But we love them still and you love them even more. So we pray for each one, that you would protect them from all harm, that you would help them through the tr even the little trials they go through in life, and most of all, that you would unite them to Jesus Christ, that they would grow in faith, that the Holy Spirit would be active in them, and that you would help us as a church to love and value and teach them, especially be with the parents at this time, that they would raise their children in the fear and the admonition of you, O Lord, and that they would be strengthened to teach them the gospel, to discipline them well, and, O Lord, to encourage them in grace. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to continue to worship in song with, um, for all the saints. Who from their labors rest to thee by faith before the world confessed. Thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Hallelujah. Let's sing with all those who've gone before us um, to our Savior. For all the saints. Who from their labors rest to thee by faith Before the world confess thy name, O Jesus Be forever blessed, hallelujah, hallelujah Thou wast their rock, their fortress and their might Thou, Lord, their captain in the well-fought fight, thou in the darkness, drear their one true light. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, may thy soldiers, faithful, true, and bold, fight as the saints who know we fought of old and win with them. The victor's crown of gold, hallelujah, hallelujah. The evening brightens in the west, soon, soon to faithful warriors comes. Their rescue is the call of paradise, the blessed, hallelujah. A yet more glorious day, the saints triumphant, rise in bright array, the King of glory passes on his way, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
From earth's wide bounds, from ocean's farthest coast, through gates of pearl, streams in the countless host, singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. I feel like I win when I get to take this off, so I'm sorry for the rest of you. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Heath uh, McLawen. Uh, I know Chris has problems with it. It's not spelled anything uh, like it's actually pronounced. I blame my parents, but um, I'm the RUF campus minister, and uh, yeah, what a crazy year. Uh, Chris said I could give a little update, and... Man, we're only three weeks in, and it feels like it should be November in some ways. Uh, but we are getting to do in-person worship on Tuesday nights in the parking lot here at Grace Covenant, which has been amazing. I, have, I don't think I ever realized how much corporate worship really means to me uh, until it was gone. Uh, Zoom and YouTube are great. But getting to actually be with people like this in this room, even though we're all spread out, uh, and worship the Lord has been, even over the last three weeks, balm to my soul in a lot of ways. Um, we've got Bible studies up and running. Everything feels like it's always in flux this year. Uh, there's three more layers of complexity to every single thing we do, and feels like the target just moves every time we're getting ready to do something. So please pray for us. Pray for wisdom. Uh, pray that through me and through RUF that God's grace and the gospel would go forth. Um, it's always good to be here at Grace Covenant. One of the most surprising things throughout the quarantine and pandemic, I think for me personally, was the level of interest in the length of my hair, uh, whether I was helping out with worship or preaching on the live stream, I kept getting texts, and there's a lot of people that were very concerned about the length of my hair. And one of the things RUF is doing is we're doing a live stream as well for those that can't be with us, a YouTube. So if you're really bored, or you need something to help you like take a nap in the middle of the afternoon, the RUF Virginia Tech live stream is up. We can help with that. But one week, or after the first week, I listened to it to try to check the sound quality. And as I did that, I made the mistake of letting the video go too far, and it got to my own preaching. And I haven't watched myself preach since the horrible preaching classes in seminary where you have to stand up there and preach and then everyone gets to critique you. And I hadn't done that. And for those of you that always thought my hair was too long, about three minutes into my sermon, I had done this number, uh, I think, four or five times. And I realized you were right. It is very distracting. Uh, so the next day I got my hair cut. And so here we are. Uh, so for those of you that care, we're going to try to keep it on the shorter side. That was a really long intro for some reason, but uh, we're going to be in Mark 2 today. So if you've got your Bibles, turn there. I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. Let's give attention to the reading of God's Word. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days... It was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. 
And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sin but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. The word of the Lord. Let me pray for our time together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can be together in person, that we can gather together uh, across Blacksburg and across the world uh, through your spirit and technology uh, and be with one another. So now as we turn our attention to your word, would you open our ears and our minds and our hearts to hear the good news of your gospel? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so as we get started, let me ask a question. What is our deepest desire? What is that one thing that we want more than anything else? I grew up playing really competitive tennis traveling around to tournaments around Tennessee and the Southeast. I desperately wanted to win matches and tournaments to get a higher ranking. And so I put in tons of hours practicing. And I had my hero, my tennis hero was Andre Agassi. I would use the same rackets he did, the ones he endorsed. I like to think our games were similar, although on very different levels. Um, And after he retired, he released this book called Open. It was this autobiography, and as he's going through his life in tennis, after he finally won Wimbledon, maybe the most prestigious tournament in the world, he had this to say. But I don't feel that Wimbledon has changed me. I feel, in fact, as if I've been let in on a dirty little secret. Winning changes nothing. Now that I've won a slam, I know something that very few people on the earth are permitted to know. A win doesn't feel as good as a loss feels bad. And the good feeling doesn't last as long as the bad, not even close. And so he won the most prestigious tournament in the world. And then at some point later, he became the number one ranked tennis player in the world. And he said to a reporter, he said, I'm happy about the ranking, the new number one. That is, it feels the best that I can be, but it's a lie. This isn't at all what I feel. It's what I want to feel. It's what I expected to feel, what I tell myself to feel. But in fact, I feel nothing. So this man has chased wins. He's chased rankings, and he has achieved them. And they left him feeling let down. And there are quotes like these everywhere. I love sports, so all of mine seem to come from the sports world. I mean, there's Tom Brady, that after he won his first three Super Bowls, a reporter asked, which one is your favorite? And he said, the next one. There's an Olympic gold medalist uh, cyclist, Victoria Pendleton. She said before the Olympics, she was an emotional wreck. She was worried that she would be the one person to let the team down. So she said winning was just a relief. And even that felt like a complete anticlimax. It was very surreal on the podium. And as soon as I stepped off of it, I thought, what on earth am I going to do now? I found it quite hard to deal with, as if I've got no purpose anymore. 
And even Madonna, after she would achieve something, would describe her life as a never-ending quest against mediocrity. There are quotes like these all over the place, especially from the famous, uh, those athletes that achieve the highest levels in their sport. And I'll throw out a couple more as we go along. But what we as humans think is our greatest need, our greatest desire That when attained, it leaves us wanting more. And so today we see a man who actually got his greatest desire. But unlike Agassiz or many others, he walked away content. He walked away fulfilled. And so I wonder what is different about this man. And so I want to look at two things today. And by looking at the deeper problem and then the total healing, I want us to see why this man was different. That Jesus didn't stop at this man's desire. I want us to see that Jesus goes far deeper than just our desires, our needs, by looking at deeper problems and total healing. So let's start off with the idea of deeper problems. In verse 1, it says, basically, Jesus is home that he's come back to Capernaum and his fame has grown. And if we were like walking all the way through Mark together, we would have seen that he's been healing lots and lots of people. Uh, just before this, he had cleansed a leper. And then the leper went and told everybody about that healing, that Jesus had done this for him. And so... Um, Everybody wants to be around Jesus now. They want to hear him. They want to get near him. They want to be healed by him. And so Jesus can no longer go anywhere without a crowd. And so at the beginning of our text, we see Jesus is in a home, and that home is full of people. Even the doorway is crowded so that no one else can get in. And we see that there's this paralytic man brought to Jesus by by four men. We don't know who these four men are. They could be friends. They could be family. But these four men, they know what Jesus can do. They've heard the rumors. They know he can heal. They are desperate for the healing of this man. But since they can't get through this door because of the crowd, there's probably some outdoor stairs. They climb to the roof and proceed to dig a hole in somebody else's house in their roof. And then lower this paralytic man on his bed in front of Jesus. And I think to the paralytic man, to his friends, to Jesus, to everybody inside that house, the desire would have been abundantly clear. They would have known exactly why he was there. They came for their friend's healing. And we don't know how long this man has been paralyzed, but imagine for a moment what it would feel like to be this man. I mean, sitting on his bed day after day, maybe getting dropped off somewhere by these same four people to beg, or at least being completely dependent upon his friends or his family, even for survival. And then watching people walk around walk around him, walk around the town, and growing envious, thinking how if only he could walk, everything would be better, how much better his life would be. As I think about this text, as I think about this paralytic man, I think about how often we are like him thinking, if only, and then fill in the blank. If only... We got this. Everything would be all right. We would finally be happy. We would finally be content. And we all fill in that blank somehow. Maybe we fill it in with some sort of success. I mean, if we're a senior, maybe it's a position after graduation. I mean, if we're in the workforce, maybe it's a certain net worth, a certain job uh, at our company. I mean, maybe we fill it with, if only I had a relationship, if only I had a certain person or any person, if only I was married, if only we had a child. 
Maybe it's an accomplishment. If only I could get an A in that one class. And for me, maybe it was, if only I was good enough to get a certain ranking in tennis. Maybe it's awards. Maybe it's recognition. Maybe it's, if only we could stop something. If I could just stop getting drunk. If I could just stop being depressed. If I could only stop cutting myself. Maybe it's a change of circumstance. Maybe we're chronically ill. If only my illness could be cured. If only my parents could get back together. Or how many of us have uttered this one in the last, what, six months? If only this virus would go away. Everything would be better. Everything would be all right. Everything would go back to normal. We all have these conditions that we think if they were to happen, we would finally be content, finally be happy. But through his response, Jesus shows us that if those things were to happen, it still wouldn't be enough. The paralytic and his friends came with one goal in mind, healing. And yet Jesus had a far deeper, more total healing in mind than just walking. So that's what I want to take a look at next, the total healing that Jesus brings. In verse 5, Jesus says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And I can only imagine the shocked look on the paralytic's face, like lying on this bed. He's obviously there for a healing, and Jesus speaks to him. It's not like, get out. It's not, go away. How dare you do this? He says, son, your sins are forgiven. And I imagine kind of like crickets, everyone just kind of looking at this man, the man looking at Jesus, like, okay, what about my healing? I can only imagine these four people who lowered him down, peering through the hole in the roof in confusion and being like, what about the legs? Why would Jesus do this? Why would Jesus say this? Why would he start here? Jesus knows that everything we fill our if only blank with, that those things are going to let us down. He knows that as great as walking will be for this man, this paralytic has deeper issues and needs than whether or not his legs are going to work. I mean, think about it. So many fam famous people have worked their tails off for success, and when they achieve it, they find it, they find it lacking. And listen to Jim Carrey, uh, actor and comedian. He was introducing himself, and he says, Thank you, I'm two-time Golden Globe winner Jim Carrey. I just lost my spot. Uh, he reintroduced himself, and he's, then he said, you know, when I go to sleep at night, I'm not just some guy going to sleep. I'm two-time Golden Globe winner Jim Carrey going to get some well-needed shut-eye. And when I dream, I don't just dream any old dream. No, sir. I dream about being three-time Golden Globe winner Jim Carrey, because then... I would be enough. Then it would finally be true, and I could stop this terrible search for what I know ultimately won't fulfill me. And Carrie has success, awards, and it's not enough. There was this uh, journalist who wrote, she lived in New York, and she wrote an article, uh, her name was Cynthia Heimel, about people who she knew were perfectly nice people trying to make it in the theater industry in New York City. And she noted that when they made it, they became awful people. 
She said they had achieved the thing that they were longing for that would make their lives fulfilled and happy, and nothing changed. They were still themselves. That disillusionment turned them howling and insufferable. And then Miss Heimel makes this amazing statement. I think God, or I think when God wants to play a really rotten practical joke on you, he grants you your deepest wish. And what she's saying is, if God really were vindictive and mean like this, whatever we fill that blank with, if only I got the number one ranking, if only I got that job or that relationship, that if God were playing a practical joke, he would give it to us and we would know just how much it lets us down. But the thing is, the thing about Jesus is that he is not playing jokes. He's not mean. He's not vindictive. He's kind. He's loving. He's lowly. He's meek. And so here in verse 5, Jesus doesn't give the paralytic what he thinks he needs. Jesus doesn't give the paralytic the one thing he wants more than anything else. Jesus goes far deeper. Jesus goes to what this man really needs. See, when the paralytic or us look to any of our if-onlys, we're treating those things basically as our saviors. Those are the things that are going to make us all right. And Jesus knows that they won't work. So instead, he tells this man, your sins are forgiven. What this man, what every one of us needs most of all, isn't physical healing or a change in circumstances or an achievement. We need forgiveness from our sins. We need forgiveness for all the things we have put in those if-only blanks, for all the things we have made out to be our Savior. And what, you, what we see is that Jesus goes so much deeper than even we think we need. We think we need a job or a relationship or a change in circumstances or the virus to go away. But Jesus knows that even if those things happen, it's not going to be enough. And so he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And then what we see is that in doing this, in saying these words, Jesus angers an entire group of people that are jammed into this house listening to him. He angers the scribes. And if you don't know, the scribes were sort of, they're sort of like a religious lawyer. They would often do contracts, but they also wrote, um, copied the scriptures. And so they knew the Hebrew scriptures incredibly well. And these scribes who are angered by this, maybe more than anyone else in that room, actually understand exactly what Jesus is saying. They're exactly right in verse 7. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And the answer is nobody. No one can forgive sin but God alone. And so even here in chapter 2 of Mark, Jesus is making an incredibly bold claim about who he is. He is claiming to be the Lord of the universe, God Almighty, and that he does, in fact, have the authority to forgive sins, to forgive the sins of this paralytic man. But it says, knowing the thoughts of the thoughts and the hearts of these scribes, he asks this odd question in verse 9. He asks, which is easier, to forgive sins or to say to this man, get up, take your mat, go home, walk? And there are two senses to this question, and I think both actually bring out truths of the gospel that we need to see. So the first sense, which is easier, to say your, forgi your sins are forgiven or be healed? I mean, in one sense, it is easier to say your sins are forgiven because no one can fact check you on that. No one can prove that statement wrong. I mean, they might be forgiven. Who can really say? 
But just so there's no confusion, Jesus goes ahead and he heals the paralytic so that everyone knows he does in fact have the authority to forgive sins. Jesus proves his word, he proves his authority uh, to forgive sin by his actions, his healing of the man. He is proving his claim to divinity. But there's a second sense in this question as well, another way to take this question. We have a lot of texts that tell us there are other miracle workers, uh, healers that were walking around in the first century around Jerusalem and Judea. And Jesus is saying, I am so much more than just another healer. I'm so much more than just another miracle worker. And Tim Keller says, any miracle worker can say, take up your mat and walk. But only the Savior of the world can say, your sins are forgiven. And so in this one episode, Jesus is claiming his divinity and his status as Savior of the world. But going back to this question, which is easier in this second sense Why is forgiving sin so difficult? To start with, only the person that is sinned against can forgive. If we were to leave this room and go outside and hang out after the service six feet apart with masks on in the appropriate ways, and you made me really mad and I punched you, and then I went home, my wife cannot forgive me for that. The person I punched has to forgive me. And and sin, I mean, think about it this way. That's not who we sin against has to forgive us, but the forgiveness is also in relationship to the, uh, the magnitude, the greatness of the one we have sinned against. We're going to take, I like to punch people apparently, so we're going to run with this illustration And this is no commentary on any politics whatsoever. If I were to punch you, no one would really care. You would care, but not that much would happen. If I were to get close enough and punch the President of the United States, bad things are going to happen to me. No matter who that President is, no political statement here whatsoever. The severity, the magnitude of my sin is in relation to who I have sinned against. And our sin is against the infinite, eternal God of the universe, which means the consequences of sin are infinite and eternal. And so when Jesus says, which is harder, it's so much harder to forgive sin. It's going to take something incredibly radical, something amazingly costly, to forgive sin. And what we see is that the forgiveness of sins for this paralytic here, for us, for everyone, is eventually going to cost Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, his life. Even here, Jesus knows that. And by making the statement he does, your sins are forgiven, He is taking one of the very first steps towards the cross. It is incredibly costly and difficult to forgive sins. It is, the cost is so great that God himself, Jesus, has to die to pay it. And Jesus willingly pays it on the cross. He takes our place, he takes the paralytic's place so that... um, On that day, and then now to each one of us, Jesus can say, son or daughter, your sins are forgiven. That's the good news of the gospel. That Jesus gives us what we really need. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us reconciliation with God. He doesn't just give us what we want or what we think we need. He's not playing some cruel-spirited joke on us. 
And this man, this paralytic, he is healed. He gets up and he walks out in front of everybody. And he's healed not just physically, but he's healed all the way down. He gets what he most needs. And that same thing is on offer to us. In Jesus, there's more happiness, more contentment, more fulfillment than any of our if-onlys could ever give us. And so I began by asking, what is our deepest desire? And no matter what it is, it pales in comparison to what is on offer in Jesus. And in fact, that desire, all of our desires, are meant to point not to it, but to our greater desire, our greater need for Jesus. Our longing for a relationship is meant to point us to the greatest relationship we could ever have with God himself. Our desire for status, for accomplishment, points us to our need, our desire for a status in Jesus that can never be shaken. It can never be taken away, that of a forgiven, beloved child of God. Our desire for security points us towards the eternal security that can only be found in Jesus. And so no matter what our desire is, hidden up under it, it's actually a desire for our God, for our Savior, Jesus. And we see that whether Jesus grants us that desire or not, in I'm not saying that Jesus is going to forgive us and then give us all of our wildest imagination, like all the desires of our hearts. This text isn't saying that. So whether Jesus grants that or not, Jesus, through his life and his death and his resurrection, actually fulfills the greater desire, the greater need that each one of us has. And that's the good news of the gospel for us this morning. Let me pray for us. Our God and our Father, you give us so much more than we ever thought we needed. We want a change in circumstance. We want things. And all of those point to we really just want you. We really need you. We need forgiveness. And Lord, we are so thankful that in Jesus, on the cross, there is forgiveness of sin. So that for those of us who believe in Jesus, for those who are yours, you can say, son or daughter, your sins are forgiven. Would you help us to know the truth of that, to feel it deep down, to find contentment in it? We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, thank you very much, Heath, for bringing us such an encouraging word. We are at our hour, and if for safety's sake you feel the need to, to, to leave quietly while I'm praying, uh, feel free to do so. But we're going to take another five or ten minutes to pray and sing. So we're going to go another probably about ten more minutes to, to, to um, we, this is a time where we need to, to pray and lift up our needs to the Lord, be fed by God's word, but also pray. So uh, let's, uh, let me, I'm going to lead us in prayer, and I'd ask you to join with us. If you want individual prayer, um, I will be, a few minutes after the service, I'll go over by that picnic bench, and I'm happy to pray with you in a, in a safe manner uh, as well. If you're at home and you would like individual prayer, I just invite you to email me or Pastor Rolo or one of the elders uh, and we'd love to lift up your need in prayer together. The elders are meeting tomorrow night, and we'd love to do that. Let's join together and pray. Father, thank you for this encouraging word of the gospel. Thank you for Heath and his work on the campus, loving students. But we thank you that we've heard that you meet our deepest needs in Christ Jesus as we trust you. Lord, you know we all have physical needs, desperate things that we want on earth. Lord, you know I want to be able to walk again strongly and fully and as I once was before Lyme disease hit. You know I want that. 
And I thank you for the healing that you have provided so far. But more than that, I thank you that my sins are forgiven in Christ. Help me to rejoice in that and to learn the lessons you have for me uh, over these many years. And we thank you, O oh Lord, for taking care of us in so many ways, spiritually and physically, that you do, in fact, in your perfect timing, forgive all our sins and heal all our diseases. And already we have forgiveness in Christ. We thank you for many temporal blessings in life, for taking care of us financially and in our families. We rejoice that you have given new uh, life to mothers in our church. Uh, for Shanda and Jewel, we pray for protection. We rejoice that Adrian Canales is also now expecting, and we rejoice with her and Keith, uh, and ask again for your protection on them as well. Lord, we pray for those in need, some that we can see and others that we cannot see because of the situation. We pray for those that are shut in, that you would care especially for them. We pray for our sister Florence Weyburn and her health needs at this time, and for Don, her, uh, her husband. We pray for Reba Edwards, and thank you for her sweet spirit. Give her perseverance through this time. Thank you for her family that's providing for her. We pray, Lord, for Truman and Donna Kelly, and thank you again for their sweet spirit. Please provide for them in this time. Father, we also pray for those that are in a mental anguish in this time, those that are worried about the virus, those that are lonely because of the, um, the social distancing. We pray for others that are under stress, either with conflict within or without the church. Lord, give them peace, help them to trust Jesus, help them to take up the cross as they would uh, seek as much as it is possible with them to be at peace with all people but we pray for peace and unity across your church in this time. Father, we pray for our ministries of the church as we begin to, this fall with many new activities and yet restrained. We pray for our, the various home groups, whether by Zoom or otherwise, that your spirit would be there. Thank you for our women's ministry, that you would bless them. Lord, we thank you for the many college ministries that are beginning in this time, for RUF and InterVarsity and CCF and Crew and Valor and Young Life and BCM and Navigators and Campus Outreach and many others. We pray you'd bless their leaders, students and staff, that freshmen would come and feel welcomed and grow in grace. We pray for our own church, that you'd help us to love students. We pray for the college meals uh, in backyards, that those would be sp uh, spiritual, blessed times. Lord, we pray for our youth group as it begins up again. And we thank you for Pastor Rolo and all the work he has done as a pastor across this church, uh, uh, across the many ministries this past summer. We pray you'd strengthen him and Erica as they would continue on. We do pray, O oh Lord, that you'd raise up new women as leaders in our church and our various committees. We pray, pray for new men to be elders and deacons. We pray particularly that you would raise up new men to be gospel ministers, that you would guide our church for the future that you would tell us, uh, show us clearly when it might be time to plant new churches, as we did with Providence. Uh, we pray for Providence. We thank you for them, but help us as a church know what we should do. And help us, Lord, as we would seek your, your wisdom on staffing and, and, and paying for a new roof and all these things. We thank you for providing for us and pray you would give wisdom to the leaders. And meanwhile, help us to evangelize those, Lord, in our neighborhoods and in our dorms. Help us to spread the gospel as we can, that it would be a work of your spirit. And finally, Lord, we pray not just for our church, but for our community. We pray for our sister church down in Pulaski. Lord, it is a small church. We pray your word would go forth nevertheless. Grow them according to your will and give them wisdom as Pastor John leads them. We pray for the Pregnancy Resource Center. Thank you for their work. We thank you for our own uh, member, Christina Fleming, as she leads that. Christina, as she leads them, um, help their banquets to be successful, that they would save lives, O oh Lord. We pray for um, relief in our community and in our nation from this virus. We pray wisdom for local officials in terms of, of when to shut things down or when to move things online. Lord, as they're in a difficult situation, we pray that there would be no new outbreaks uh, and that those who get sick would be healed. 
We do pray overall for the development of a safe vaccine more rapidly than anyone expects. Lord, we pray for that. We finally, Lord, we lift up our nation to you. And as we uh, face an election season once more, we pray for peace to prevail, that there would be no violence or intimidation, that everyone who desires to vote could vote freely and without intimidation, that there would not be interference um, uh, from, from, from uh, overseas, Lord, from governments that do not care for us, that you would protect us from that, that we pray that you would protect our populace to help us to make informed decisions and not uh, be swayed by stories that are absolutely false. We pray for conspiracy theories, Lord, that are based in hatred and anger and falsehood, that they would be driven back, whether from left or right, that truth would prevail, that we would seek as Christians to desire to live at peace with our neighbors and promote a government which would endure and, and sustain that. And so we, Lord, thank you that we do have peace in this nation overall. We pray for peace to prevail in our cities. And we thank you that you give us freedom to worship Christ. We remember those overseas and our missionaries and in nations where they are oppressed. And we pray right now for churches right now that are, 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 are frightened and hidden and, and oppressed, that you would grant them relief through Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray all these things. In his name, amen. We continue to worship now with our final song. Would you stand together with us? Upon a life I had not lived, upon a death I did not die, another's life, another's death, I sing my whole eternity. Not on the tears which I have shed, not on the sorrows I have known, another Upon a life I had not lived 
We go now with this, uh, this benediction from Paul in 2 Corinthians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. If you'll turn me back on, please be seated. We're going to dismiss you from by row. Thank you for coming. We ask that you, if you fellowship outside, that you do maintain distance and please keep from congregating around the uh, entranceway. And Blacksburg wants us to keep our masks on even outside. So thank you all for coming. Stroms, thanks for all you're doing. You may be dismissed. We do ask people go outside to fellowship. Thanks for organizing those meals, guys. Um, Kimsey's will dismiss you guys as well. Thanks for coming. And yes, now the back row completely may go. And um, Eunice and your family, good to see you, Kwaku. Thanks for coming. Rolos, I don't know if you're staying in the building or not, but you all can leave. You looked nice, Taylor. Why'd you dress up when you weren't even going to be up front? Anyway, bye. Nice bow tie. Thanks, Bowmans. Thank you, a new and newly engaged couple. Not that new, I guess, but anyway. And Ben Peters, is that you? With an S, right? David and a new friend, a freshman, right? Thanks for coming. Good to see you. I can tell by the, uh, the uniform that you're a freshman. Thanks for serving in the Corps. So good to see you. Mike and... Reynolds, love you guys. Thanks for coming. Get you guys. The college crowd may be dismissed. Yeah, you can go. This is weird, but at least I get to say hi to people individually. And Kimsey's, the faithful Kimsey's. How's your mom feeling? I didn't pray for her this morning. Okay, I definitely didn't remember to pray for her. Yeah, gosh, I, I, it should. I mean, they won't even give me shots. They're like, they're worried that it's too powerful. So it should work. Well, it has to be where the pain is also. I got a secret note. Oh.